In today's video, we will be going through the 2010's American post-apocalyptic thriller film Vanishing on 7th Street. Spoilers ahead, you have been warned. Make sure to give this video a thumbs up, comment on what your favorite part was, and subscribe to our channel for more. The film opens in a theater where everyone is enjoying a movie, probably for the last time. You know this is a horror slash thriller film, so don't expect happiness for long. The projectionist Paul appears in the frame with a headlamp, controlling some knobs in the projection room. He opens his book to read about the 16th century disappearance of the Roanoke colony, which is quite similar to this movie's plot, or maybe the movie is inspired by the story, whatever. He goes out to get a juice and flirt with the lady at the canteen, perhaps just the latter. When he is about to read the first line from the book, the lights go off. Damn these lights! Paul comes out and sees no one around when the lights are back, the same way when people disappear when I need their help. He goes to the hallway and finds nothing but people's dresses and fallen popcorn boxes on the ground. He checks the hall seats and finds the same, just clothing as it is. He finds a security guard holding a torch in his hand and both of them start investigating. These two who had sources of lights with them are safe and everyone except them is gone. See, when I said there lives a monster in darkness, no one believed me. They hear sound in the departmental store and start following it. Bad idea. Don't say I didn't warn you. Without warning, the guard vanishes as his light goes off, leaving his clothes behind. As Paul hears his scream, even his light goes off for a brief moment, but it turns back on. The scene then cuts to a hospital where a woman named Rosemary, holding a flashlight, is in scrubs. She is searching for a child named Manny. We can see that everybody in the hospital has disappeared, leaving their scrubs behind. She sees a room with lights on and finds a patient with his chest cut open. Later, the light goes off and even he disappears. It's better to disappear than to sit with your chest cut open, you know. The following morning, a TV reporter, Luke Ryder, wakes up to discover the power is out. He extinguishes the candles near him. I think he should be thankful for the candles, but anyways. He starts looking for his girlfriend, Paige. She is nowhere to be seen and Luke's phone is dead. There's a basket of gifts Paige might have brought for him, a book titled Sexy Games, some handcuffs, and uh and so on. He goes to his office to see the same thing, dresses without people. Even the newspaper he picks up is from the previous day. The downtown streets are empty except for abandoned vehicles and piles of clothing. A plane crashes on the horizon because no pilots, remember? But how was the plane flying all this while, you may ask? Autopilot, maybe? Luke finds a walkie-talkie, but even it is dead. I mean, who will you talk to through the walkie-talkie if no people are remaining? When he picks up his photo with Paige, he sees movement and follows it. As he leaves, we see the darkness taking over. Three days later, we see Luke in a hoodie trying to start some cars. After failing to start one, he tries another. Hope is a good thing, but false hope is bad, you know. When he's inside a car, a man arrives there frantically pleading with him to open the door. He is scared to get consumed by the darkness, so is desperately asking for a light. Luke ignores him, like my crush does to me, and that man vanishes. In a car, he collects some batteries to spare and a gun. Then we see a 7-8 year old girl. We don't know who she is yet. Fortunately, and defying this movie's logic, he starts a car and reaches a bar. Surprisingly, all the lights in the bar are on and even the music is playing. Expecting some people, Luke goes inside holding a gun but finds nothing except the dresses of people. He then sits and enjoys a shot because even during the apocalypse, the party must go on, guys. Later, when the lights begin flickering, Luke goes to the basement. There he finds a portable generator which explains why the pub is not affected by the power outage. Did the generator company sponsor this film? Who knows? There, a 12-year-old kid, James Leary, confiscates his gun by aiming a bigger gun at him. After some back and forth, the boy introduces himself. He's the bartender's son and his mom has gone to the church promising to be back. Luke tries to convince him to get going with him, but James refuses. He says that he will wait for his mom. I'm telling you, false hope is bad, kiddo. Luke tells him that it's 11 a.m. but still dark. Daylight is getting more scarce every day. Darkness seems to be consuming everything. Later, a woman named Rosemary arrives there and frantically searches for her child, Manny. Calm 
calm down lady. She does calm down, but after she fires at Luke. The movie cuts to Paul who reappears after being consumed by darkness, not because the darkness didn't like his taste. The flashlight near Paul starts working and he is seen severely injured. He tries to move towards a bus shelter. Later, James offers water to Rosemary and she tells him that Manny is just nine months old. When James asks her if she's a doctor, the movie goes into a flashback. Rosemary, a physical therapist, is seen walking down a busy hospital passage. She comes outside to light up a cigarette. Excuse me, ma'am, your lungs! Then she hears a weird scream. The next morning, she's seen walking down a deserted street. She goes up to the cradle in her room, hoping to see the baby, but in vain. The movie cuts to the present where Luke, James, and Rosemary are talking. Rosemary shows some lights out of her bag due to which she was able to make her way out of there. Anything can fit into a lady's bag, guys, even a generator. They hear a scream outside. Luke goes searching for anyone and finds an injured Paul in the bus shelter. He brings him to the bar having a close call with the shadows. Later, Paul starts explaining how he got there. He works in the Fairlane Center. All of a sudden, the whole mall went dark. He was on his way out when the lights started dying. Someone hit him and he was taken somewhere. His light came back on and he found himself lying on the ground. When asked about the person who hit him, Paul tells him that there was no body or face. It was just some shadows. Rosemary a Catholic tells him that they are left behind as a punishment by God, which Luke condemns. The lights begin flickering again and they go down to the basement. There, Paul tells him about the Roanoke colony of 1587. When a boat with supplies came there, they found everyone gone leaving behind their food, livestock, and clothing as it is. The only word they found written was the word Croatoan. The shadows are literate, I guess to be able to write a word. Frustrated, Paul starts kicking the generator and injures himself. What else do you expect? He is brought and kept to the pool table. Rosemary asks Luke to get some ice and the movie goes into a flashback. He has another one, this time Luke's. Luke is in the broadcasting room of his office. He finds a recording where he sees his girlfriend vanishing into thin air when the lights go out. A live feed from Chicago shows a person warning the people to keep a light with themselves all the time. He also warns that the darkness may assume any shape or form to lure you to your death, hence not to trust anybody except their light. Back to the present, he tells them that he has a truck two to three blocks away, but the battery is dead. He suggests going to Chicago where they can find more survivors. The light in the bar is just a trap because when the generator fails, they'll all die. Rosemary is stubborn not to go anywhere because everything happens for a reason. And shit, this woman has set a new example for optimism. In the next room, Luke consoles James and instructs him to stay with Paul. In another room, Paul starts flirting with Rosemary because it's the appropriate time according to him. He expresses his desire to appear in movies and asks her if he has a chance. She's not a film director, she's a physical therapist, you know. Rosemary and Luke leave, instructing James to be by Paul's side and not let him fall asleep. In the next scene, Rosemary and Luke are seen pushing the truck. Paul starts questioning James if he's got a girl. He's 12 years old, please spare him. Paul starts talking like a lunatic, which he is. He asks James to play a song to which he starts singing along. Somebody remind him he's not at this bar to party. He's there amidst an apocalypse, severely injured, hoping for help. With the song, James starts imagining as if the bar is full of people, lively and noisy. Later, James goes to wash a bowl in a sink when the lights go off. There, Luke and Rosemary take a break as Luke's ankle is hurt. They talk about her child, Manny. Luke tells her about his wife, Anna, who's in Chicago. They're separated and he's afraid she doesn't even want to see his face. I mean, you have a girlfriend who brings handcuffs, right? They see the same little girl holding a light at a distance I described at the beginning. They try to talk to her, but she runs away. Even Luke nearly vanishes trying to get to her if not for the headlights of the truck. Cut to the next scene, Paul gets up and starts looking for James. He's nowhere near the sink, just the bowl is lying on the floor. In the basement, there opens a locked door by itself, revealing a seemingly endless tunnel. It's a good idea to enter inside it according to him. It's a good idea to enter inside according to him. He reaches a dead end and bam, vanishes. Luke tries to ignite the fuel, but they've got no lighter. They head towards the hospital searching for any source of lights. Lights are back on and James reappears near the sink. When he goes towards the pool table, he finds the dress Paul was wearing.
There, Luke ignites a fire with a matchstick which Rosemary found as she knows that hospital well. She claims it was because of Manny she's not yet disappeared. Manny made her want to clean up and she lived. After this emotional ride, she goes to find fuel, i.e. rubbing alcohol. Rosemary hears a baby cry outside. When she looks outside, she finds a stroller under a lit up streetlight. I'm telling you, it's a bad idea, woman. She goes there and finds the stroller empty. The streetlight goes out and guess what? She disappears too. In the next scene, we see Luke and James reunite. Luke manages to convince James that they'll make it out eventually. James sits in the truck to start the ignition and tries to connect the generator. After three attempts, they manage to start the engine and get out of there. We see a road sign indicating 7th Street indeed. They reach a church where the cargo of the truck spills over, which happens to be apples. James goes inside the church despite Luke's warning. James is a good son, how can he stop looking for his mom? What are survival instincts? Mother's love is the greatest. Luke leaves and continues his journey. I'm telling you, you'll regret your decision. Later, Luke sees a word Croatoan carved in a road sign, so he comes back to the church. Just when the shadow is about to consume James, Luke breaks through the church with the truck and asks James to get inside. James ignores him yet again and Luke himself vanishes when the headlights go off. How can someone be so selfish? This James beats my ex. Yes, I just said that. As all the candles of the church slowly extinguish, we see agitated James trying to live. The next morning, the sun rises. We see James sleeping near the last candle in the church. The little girl comes there and introduces herself as Brianna. She shows her solar flashlight as her survival tool. Later, both of them come outside and see a horse feeding on apples. In the next scene, we see Brianna and James riding the horse. As the sun sets, the camera pans to the bar where we see the shadows of Luke, Rosemary, and Paul watch the children. The solar flashlight goes on, ensuring their protection in this journey. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like the video if you enjoyed it and subscribe to the channel to see more of these movie summaries.